Welcome to Animal Rights, the Abolitionist Approach Commentary. I'm Gary Francione. This is our fifth No Frills Commentary. And in addition to whatever other consequences come as a result of having an underproduced podcast, you may also be additionally annoyed today by some thunder in the background. I'm sorry, but we're having a thunderstorm. And you may hear the whirling of the ceiling fan, which uh, is preventing us from having to use the air conditioning because it's very hot and humid today. So I apologize for any inconvenience. I hope that uh, you will be able to see or better hear past it and, um, and be engaged in the substance so that it doesn't bother you. The substance or the topic of today's uh, podcast is violence. Now, those of you who know my work know that I am opposed to violence. Uh, I discuss this in, in uh, a number of places, in books and articles and on uh, some of my blog essays. I think that violence is inherently immoral. In many ways, I, uh, I have views that are similar to those of Gandhi, King, and others. I think that there's a, 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 a problem which is inherent in the use of, of, uh, of violence. And I think that the the problems that we face in the world are all problems of violence and I do not think that violence is going to form any part of the solution to those problems. Indeed, I think that uh, the only um, uh, morally acceptable response is nonviolence. However, I am aware that many of you disagree with that and uh, many of you think that at least in some circumstances violence can be justified and that's fine. We don't have to resolve the issue today of the ultimate moral status of violence or the, the philosophical arguments in favor or against nonviolence. We don't have to discuss those issues today. Perhaps we'll do that in some future podcasts. What I want to do is suggest to you that even if you believe that violence is justified in some circumstances. I suggest to you it makes absolutely no sense to promote violence in the context of the struggle for animal rights. Absolutely none. And there are practical reasons that don't require that you agree with me on the philosophical issue, the basic philosophical issue. Let me give you just one or two of, of, of the arguments that I think are quite compelling in terms of uh, opposing violence in the struggle for animal rights. The first argument is if violence is justified, who is the appropriate target of that violence? I would like to suggest that the issue that is raised in this context is similar to the issue that's raised when we are talking about animal welfare and we have the animal welfare people telling us that well what we've got to do is go after the the institutional users of animals and we've got to try to affect supply and you know through welfare reform and I've been arguing that the problem is demand the problem is not the the institutional users it's not a question of regulating the institutional users. We're never going to be able to regulate them in any significant ways anyway because of the economic status of animals as chattel property. But the problem is we, we the consumers, who demand these products. If, if we didn't demand them, the institutional users would not be providing them. The same argument applies in this context. The same, the very same argument applies. It makes no sense to say, well, we think we should use violence against institutional animal users. What are they doing except responding to a demand that we create? And as long as the demand is there, it doesn't matter what you do. You can, you can go after, in any way you want, violently or not, a, a particular institutional user and you know what even if you succeed that demand is going to be picked up by another institutional user that's just the way it works that's just the way it works so I don't really understand when people say well you know it's alright to use violence against institutional animal users well, 
how are they morally any different from the people who are creating the demand? What I am saying is, if it's morally justifiable to use violence against them, it's morally justifiable to use violence against anybody who consumes animals. Now, I realize that there are some people who make that argument, and I think that it's um, that is so silly as to indicate some some form of of um, mental instability, frankly. But um, and and. I recognize that most people don't share that view. The overwhelming number of people, even those who support violence against institutional users, don't support that view. But it makes no sense. You know, we're we're the people who are demanding the products. So violence against an institutional animal user really doesn't make any sense. And in a sense, it's really not fair as a from from a moral point of view. If we if if we're really going to take the principle of equal consideration seriously and treat similar cases similarly, how are the institutional users any more morally blameworthy than the people who are creating the demand? And you know, this is even true in the, in, in, in the context of, I mean, in the, it's, it's particularly true in, in certain ways in the context of vivisection. People want there to be vivisection. If there, if there wasn't a demand for vivisection, then there would not be vivisection. It's something that occurs because people want it to occur. People believe, wrongly in my view, but they believe that vivisection is going to help them uh, uh, be, become healthier or have cures for various uh, uh, illnesses and conditions and whatnot. People want there to be vivisection. Indeed, it's, it's really very interesting. I, I, in, um, in my book, Animals as Persons, one of the issues I discuss is uh, the fact that uh, there are many ways of solving health issues. Not just one way, uh, there are many ways. And, and uh, to the extent that we pursue one way of solving a problem, we take resources away from solving the problem in another way. Now, interestingly, we've learned very little, if anything, in using animals uh, in, in animal tests with respect to AIDS. We've learned very, very little. Now, if we really wanted to cut down on new issues of, or new cases of HIV, we could do that, but that would require that we have sex education, that would require things like needle exchange. Those are politically con controversial. Condom distribution, those are politically controversial. If we wanted the resources to go there, we could demand that. In fact, we don't demand that. Quite the contrary, at least in some places like the United States, those sorts of measures are opposed by many, many people who would much rather there be vivisection than, than, than that there be condom distribution or safe sex education or needle distribution. So again, there are choices that we could make that we don't make. So why are the vivisectors the responsible parties? Do they tell us that this stuff, that, that the vivisection is, 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 uh, is, is good? Yes, of course they do. Institutional animal users are promoting what they do. But so what? We're the ones who are demanding it. You know, we're not automatons. They can tell us whatever they want to tell us. We are capable of assessing the situation and getting the information. So it doesn't really matter if the meat industry tells us we've got to eat meat or we're going to die. We know that's not true. We can get access to the information. If vivisectors are going to tell us that, and they, they do, that vivisection is essential for human health, we can get the information. We can make assessments. We're not automatons. So I think it's very important to understand that if we're going to be moral, if we're going to think morally about this, we've got to treat similar cases similarly. And I just don't see how institutional animal users are any more culpable than those of us who are demanding the products. And, and, and that's the overwhelming number of us. So the idea that, well, going after institutional users is going to somehow make a difference um, is 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 just wrong. First of all, they're not doing anything that is morally different from what we are doing when we demand these products. And secondly, 
even if you succeed in shutting down one institutional user, as long as the demand is there, that demand is going to be picked up by another institutional user. So this, doesn't, this just doesn't make any practical sense. Moreover, acts of violence have no cultural meaning in a society. It's not that people are looking at these acts of violence and saying, oh, well, yes, maybe I now need to think about, about animal rights. There's no edu there's, no, there's nothing educational about these 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 events because there is no cultural context in in which people can understand them. Okay, it's not like when we were dealing with race-based slavery in the United States. Again, I'm not saying that violence is ever justified, but we don't have to discuss the issue of whether it's ever justified. I'm saying that in the context of American race-based slavery, there was a lot of opposition to it, an enormous amount of opposition to it. There was a lot of opposition to, 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 to slavery right from the beginning. It was never a completely accepted institution, even in the South. I mean, it was a controversial, controversial institution. And what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that to the extent that there were acts of violence in the context of slavery, those acts had, had cultural meaning. They, they, they existed within a cultural context in which there was a lot of opposition to slavery, and so those events had some cultural meaning. Violent actions undertaken on behalf or supposedly on behalf of animals those acts have no cultural meaning. They don't. They don't. They don't mean anything to anybody. It, what they do do is 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 marginalize. They make. They give people an excuse to dismiss and to marginalize the issue of animal exploitation, because most people are engaged in animal exploitation and. They don't think of it that way because we haven't done a good job of, we have really have done a very, very poor job of educating people about this issue. As a matter of fact, it is appalling to me how, how poorly we have educated people and how we have really failed in that fundamental mission. I want to talk about that in a second. But think about something for a second. You know, most people eat animal products. They don't need to do that. So in a sense, most people are supporting animal exploitation simply for reasons of pleasure, amusement, or convenience. We've talked about this before. Now, when, when, when violence is proposed, and it's oftentimes proposed against people who are engaged in vivisection. Well, although I don't agree with any use of animals in vivisection, and I don't, not, not, not any use of animals, I think the use of animals in experiments that are supposed to be finding data to cure important or serious human illnesses is the only use of animals that isn't transparently frivolous. I don't think it's morally justifiable and I think there are all sorts of questions about the necessity of animal use, all sorts of, of empirical questions about the necessity. I don't think any of it can be justified whether it's empirically necessary or not. But the bottom line is, is at least it's not transparently frivolous. And I do not understand how anybody who proposes violence against vivisection thinks that this is going to have any cultural meaning to people who are not really thinking very clearly about the issue anyway and are already accepting a lot of exploitation of animals for no reason, for transparently frivolous reasons, and you think that this is somehow going to educate them um, or make them aware about rejecting animal use in situations that they think are really important, a lot more important as to whether, than whether they you know, eat that hamburger or that dish of ice cream. So even if you do not accept my basic rejection of violence as a general fundamental moral rule, and I know that many of you don't, I would still suggest to you that even if you don't, there are still compelling reasons why violence in the struggle for animal rights makes no sense, given that we are the ones who are doing the demanding. Violence against the institutional users makes no sense. Even if you're successful, the demand, because we continue to demand, the demand gets picked up by somebody else. And so what you end up doing is engaging in violence and inflicting harm for what end? The demand, the demand is still there. There'll be another party that will move in. 
And violence, supposedly, in the struggle for animal rights, has no cultural meaning, no cultural significance. It doesn't resonate with anybody. It doesn't, it doesn't get them to think. I'll tell you what gets them to think. I will tell you that I think we've done a very, very good job, those of us who have been promoting this Michael Vick situation as an excellent educational tool, and a number of you have. There have been a number of people I've seen who have been trying to promote the discussion about why is Michael Vick any different from the rest of us? We're all tolerating animal exploitation. We're all participating in animal exploitation. That's getting people thinking. I'm telling you that's getting people thinking. That's the sort of thing that gets people thinking. Violent acts don't get them thinking because they have no context in which to perceive or interpret these acts as having any significance whatsoever except to show that animal people are crazy or that animal people are are it's all right to put aside or dismiss the issue because the people who are promoting the issue are doing things that don't make any sense to them. If we want a peaceful world, we have to, as Gandhi said, you know, we've got to become the change we wish to see. Education here is key, and I do not accept this notion that education is passive. That's, that's someone's characterization. It's not the reality. Nonviolent, creative, vegan education is anything but passive. And again, all you've got to do is look to see what folks are doing out there. There's an emerging movement of people who are committed to creative, nonviolent, vegan education. And they're doing marvelous things. They're doing all sorts of creative things and they're having all they're getting very good results. We need to shift the paradigm. We really do need to shift the paradigm. We've got to get people away from thinking of animals as things. You don't do that with violence. You don't do that with any sort of coercion. You do that through education. It's, it's anything but passive. I'm not suggesting that you should engage people in discussion who don't want to engage you in discussion. I am suggesting there are a lot of people out there who would be willing to engage in discussion and are willing to engage in discussion. Again, the Michael Vick situation shows that this is true. There are a lot of folks out there who once you, you, you present the, the arguments to them in, in a rational way and you help them to see, you, you, know, you, you, you provide the proper analogies and you provide some good solid reasoning you get people thinking. Is it going to work with everybody? No, but nothing. You know, no, no strategy is going to be, you know, is, 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 is going to work with everyone. But, as I've argued before, animal welfare doesn't do anything except to increase the production efficiency of animal products. I mean, it, it, does, it does nothing to move animals away from the, um, the, their status as property. Indeed, it further enmeshes them in it. And violence doesn't do, I mean, violence does nothing. All violence does is give people an excuse to dismiss the issue of animal ethics. And so I, I suggest to you, and, and I, I want to make a, a, a final point because people always ask me about, well, you know, violence against individuals or against persons, human persons, that's one thing. But what's wrong with violence against property? Well, you know what? There, there's another distinction that falls apart when you look at it. When you engage in violence towards property, you're always putting humans and non-humans at risk. You're always... whether When someone damages some building that is you know, supposedly completely empty, you don't know it's completely empty. There are plenty of animals that are living in there, in the walls and whatnot. So there is going to be harm. The idea that there is no harm, there's no harm that comes from property damage is what I hear from some people. That's nonsense. Of course there is. Moreover, you, you have situations where humans can be uh, unintentionally harmed and you can have situations occur which are not intended but, but where harm presents itself. 
For example, you break into a place and you know there's somebody there working as a security guard well you know this is a person who's probably you know not a rich person or you know not a not not really what you would consider to be the institutional user this is some person who's sitting there who's making you know minimum wage or a dollar more or whatever sitting there as a security guard you've now set up a situation of conf conflict and confrontation which might end up in people being injured the bottom line is you can't really make a distinction between damage or injuring humans and injuring property and, and finally, I want to go back to an idea that I repeat again and again and again. And I, I keep repeating it because I think it's important. I think you need to understand it. It's all a zero-sum game. Every dollar, or, you know, I know some of you listen to this in other countries, whatever unit of currency, um, every euro um, that we spend, every second of time that we spend on something is less money, less time we spend on something something else. And so the, the the question becomes again, even if you don't agree with me on on a number of the things that I'm proposing in terms of the inherent immorality of violence or of some of the things I say about welfare reform, bottom line is how do we most effectively change things? Animal welfare isn't working. We've had it for hundreds of years. It's not changing anything. If anything, it's making people more comfortable about animal exploitation. Spending time and money on violence is doing nothing except marginalizing us further and giving people an excuse to put aside a very, very important moral issue because it's being promoted by people who are perceived, or some small number of people, who are perceived to not in any way reflect the moral culture in which we all live. And, and it's important to understand, in order to change things, you have got to, you've got to address, you've got to engage that moral culture. It's fine to say, oh, we're just going to reject it all. Yes, that's great. That's great, you know, it's terrific. But you've got to engage it to change it. I've said before, the only revolutions that ever work are revolutions of the heart. I maintain that. I know that there are many of you out there who disagree with it. But I assure you of one thing. It's anything but passive. It's very, very active. And, you know, Gandhi said, nothing was more powerful than nonviolence. Nonviolence was it is more powerful than any of the weapons that humans have created. I believe that. I believe that very strongly. But even if you don't, I suggest that the arguments in favor of violence in the struggle for animal rights simply don't cut it. They make no sense. Visit us at abolitionistapproach.com or at Facebook or Twitter. Thanks very much for listening.